And welcome to Community TV of Santa Cruz. Today we have some great guests. I am Lou Tuosto, and uh, this is Let's Talk with Lou. Uh, this evening we are going to have uh, a couple public servants, and they are always wonderful for information, uh, and they keep up on all the local news, uh, and we have some movers and shakers as usual. Uh, and I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for being here with us, uh, Zach Friend. Appreciate you being here. It's good to be back, Lou. Thanks for having me on. Okay. And uh, we also uh, have somebody from the city of Capitola for the first time, uh, and that's Ed Bodarf. Good to be here, Lou. It's a friendly environment. Yeah. Welcome. We were talking a little earlier, and uh, we have a lot in common because we both went to the same Catholic high school over in the Bay Area, and it's always good to have a connection like that. It's always fun to talk about old times and football and coaches and things like that. The glory days, Lou. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, tonight, um, as usual, we are going to talk uh, with each of these gentlemen, but I want to give you a little bit uh, about uh, each of them. And uh, sometimes I, I go a little bit too long, but each of them have a, a, a great history in terms of serving our community and doing the kinds of things that electeds do. And let's start uh, off uh, with Ed. And Ed first uh, served in the city of Capitola, and you've been serving uh, for seven years. You're currently uh, still on that uh, on that board. and. Uh, serving in the Santa Cruz uh, Regional Transportation Commission, uh, Local Agency Commission, LAFCO, and the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, um, uh, also on the Board of Directors for the Capitola Public Safety Foundation, uh, and runs an annual golf tournament. Uh, and you're a retired firefighter and paramedic with 30 years of service, uh, living currently in Capitola. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to start out uh, with um, talking to you about a few questions, and we'll finish up uh, with Zach. But I wanted to give uh, Zach's background too, uh, and talk a little bit about who who he is and where he's come from. I think you know, for one thing, I, I feel very privileged to even have you on the show for sure, Zach, because uh, you've done so much, but not just for our community, but for other areas uh, as well. And uh, currently serving as the second district supervisor of Santa Cruz County. Uh, in the d uh, diverse uh, district includes uh, coastal commissions, uh, co excuse me, communities uh, of Aptos, La Selva Beach, Sea Cliff, Rio Del Mar, along with some of the most productive ag land uh, in the county and the communities of Coralitas and Freedom as well in Pajaro uh, Valley Basin. Um, portions of the cities of Capitol and Watsonville are also included. Um, prior to the election, uh, Zach worked uh, for the White House uh, in the as an economic advisor, U.S. Senate, U.S. House of Representatives, and nearly a decade with the Santa Cruz Police Department as a press information uh, person. Uh, additionally, Zach served uh, on the Barack Obama and John Kerry presidential campaign as a battleground press secretary, spokesman, and campaign strategist. Um, I, I love this. I've read your book, a uh, great book. And I did have to pay for it, too, full price. I thought I'd get a comp, but uh, I think you offered a little bit late. But I do want a signature on that. It's an original. You, know? you actually lose value if I sign it, Lou. I just wanted you to know that. Yeah. Times Publishing released um, your book on message uh, and how a compelling narrative uh, will make your organization succeed late in 2013. Uh, the marketing category uh, won a prestigious Axiom Business Book Award in the networking communication category written uh, for the Hutting, uh, Huffington Post and Business Insider and been quoted for ABC, uh, CBS, CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, National Public Radio, the LA Times, New York Times, and others uh, in 2017 and appointed by uh, former Governor Jerry Brown to the California Film Commission. Um, studied at, uh, we're talking a little bit about this, at Georgetown, but as well, a graduate from UCSC. So you've got a lot of local roots. Yes. Okay. Thank you for being here, uh, Zach. And we will come back, and there's uh, some good crossover conversation that, uh, that are, uh, is going to happen between these two gentlemen um, because they serve on some committees together. Let's start out with, uh, with, with Ed. You know, the last uh, meeting that I went to, which was a city council meeting in Capitola, there was some talk about a hotel, but then there was also talk about the Capitola Mall and some potential housing uh, that's being proposed. And certainly uh, we have a challenge in our community because we've got a housing shortage. Uh, a friend of mine, a dear friend that just retired from UCS, he was head of housing, and he said it's going to take some years for us to ever catch up to what the need is. 
Uh, and I think it's pretty out there that we live in some of the most expensive area area in the in the state for housing. Let's talk a little bit about the mall and some uh, some things that are uh, happening uh, and what's proposed, if we could, Ed. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting time for Capitola. I call it a, a bright future because uh, the mall was uh, was struggling for a long time. I think we all witnessed it struggling, and uh, some new buyers came in and purchased it. And uh, they're interested in putting in a large sum of money into rebuilding that mall. And a big component of that is the is uh, they want to put in some housing, some apartments, which, as you mentioned, you know, we've Capitol has been struggling to try to meet, you know, uh, some of the numbers that that are recommended by the state for housing and what we should supply. And there was no way we could do it because anybody that's been in Capitola realizes it's completely built out. So this mall opportunity is a chance to, you know, revitalize it. They're not even going to call it Capitola Mall. It's going to have a completely different name because it's a new concept of how, you know, a commercial and, and retail interface with the community. And this concept of having the housing, I think they're talking somewhere around 650 units. Say it again? 650 units. Okay. Yeah, and and so it it's you know it's going to provide a lot of housing for it in a, in an area that you know quite frankly people want to live in Capitola. So sure. this is this is going to be good. It it's going to support that base at the mall. There's going to I think they're talking about a new theater. You know I don't really know where it's going to go because we're actually sitting down next week with them to have the mm -hmm. conversation about what do we want this all to look like. You know, so the city council is meeting with them next week and. Uh, give some input, but the, the the basic plan they're having with housing and and, and new retail and uh, you know some of the main anchor stores will remain Macy's and Target, but uh, the rest of it uh, could be wide open and it's you know pretty interesting. Where the house is going to go? Uh, that's that's a lot of units, and I'm thinking in terms of that uh, small of a geographical area. Uh, I mean, are they going to be S SROs? Are they going to be um, large houses, small houses, combination? Yeah, you know that that's a good question. You know what people maybe may not realize is they go to the mall, they, they all know that 41st Avenue gets congested and crowded, so they think it's full of traffic, but the actual parking in the mall, they, this rated as being overparked, which means there's excess space. Okay. And on that space, they're going to be able to develop those pads where they'll be commercial on the first floor and then probably three floors of apartments above it. Their, their plan is to be all apartments, large portion of it, uh, I shouldn't say large, probably 20 or 30 percent affordable housing. So, you know, it, it should appeal to a lot of people. Can we talk about the uh, affordable housing uh, element? Um, I, I've got a little exposure uh, to that as a, 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 in, in getting involved in the planning commission for the county. I, I've got very little exposure to it just the last year. Um, but certainly there's a need for affordable housing, uh, modest income housing. Because uh, one thing that, uh, it, uh, that I am always taken by is that we've, we've got one of the finest uh, junior colleges and universities, I believe, in the state of California, UCSC and Cabrillo. Uh, we turn out uh, a lot of uh, uh, firefighters, uh, nurses, hygienists, high-paid people from the college, at, at, at least real. And then we have to turn them away and they have to go somewhere else because they, they have a hard time uh, staying here. Uh, our children, uh, uh, same thing. You know, we all are challenged by that. It's like, where are my kids going to go? And do I get to see my grandkids? Uh, fortunately, all my kids live local. That's kind of unusual uh, to have that kind of uh, element happening. So when we talk about affordable housing, uh, let's talk a little bit about that element and how is that is that a, a is that a pipe dream? Is it something that you think will happen? And how might that be implemented in Capitola? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's a pipe dream. I think part of part of the pr plan that we're going to develop with the de with the builders is you know let's come up with a plan that works for Capitola and works for Santa Cruz County. You know, Capitola just can't say that we we exist without the county. We have to you know exist within the guidelines of trying to provide some housing. So we will make a compromise with them on, on you know, what, what they're going to contribute, what, what the city of Capitola is going to derive as a benefit. And part of that will be a certain designation of affordable units that people can live in. And part of the idea might be that people would be able to live where they work. And that's yes. part of our plan to maybe reduce some of the traffic and congestion in that area is that people will embrace that idea of, you know, living where they work in Capitola and, and or, or somewhere nearby in the county. Sure. And then it keeps, for sure, it keeps the revenue here, too. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, for uh, for a lot, you know, a lot of folks, uh, you know, they do commute. Uh, uh, there's a huge percentage, maybe Zach is familiar with some of those numbers, but uh, be able to keep some of those folks here uh, and have all the infrastructure so that people don't have to go over the hill uh, to do those kinds of things. People love, once you get here, they, they love to stay for sure. Uh, housing will keep people here for sure uh, and, get, and get people here. And um, I know one thing that uh, even with the 
some of our medical providers, our big uh, issue uh, at uh, one of our medical groups is to keep doctors here, but also bring them in because they come in, uh, you know, out of uh, out of med school and they've got really uh, uh, high exorbitant, you know, uh, loans that they're paying on, uh, student loans, uh, and, and a lot of them can't afford to be here, even uh, though that some of our medical facilities pay really uh, well. Um, it's just to be able to get them. I know we have primary care doctor uh, challenges right now, um, and not just, again, bring new docs in, but keep them here because of, uh, uh, of the housing uh, issue. So it sounds like we've got some good things uh, in the works uh, in the city of Capitola, um, and it sounds like that this uh, particular project will ad address that. Are you at liberty to say what the numbers might be in terms of housing, uh, what, you're what they're proposing? I, well, they've given us a ballpark. You know, we, everything's negotiable at this point, but you know, we, we're we're somewhere between six and seven hundred units. And for Capitola, okay. you know, our normal build out of units when we, in any given year, could be twenty five to thirty units is all we've added. Mm -hmm. And so the the idea, the concept of having six hundred units appearing in Capitola, I think is exciting for people who said, you know, I I want to come over and live in this side. I want to be by the by the ocean. And yeah. and if they can get a job here or somehow you know relocate the, their work force here or work out of their home. It's a it's a boom for both of us. We're going to have some uh, uh, probably have some uh, need for more housing with the new uh, recent buyout. And, and Google owns a, a a company called Looker. I think it's what it's called. They, they did this big thing, and so we've got a lot of high end potential people coming in. Uh, I don't know if Zach wants to talk a little bit about that, but you're familiar with that probably. Well, I mean, first I just want to compliment uh, the city of Capitola for their for their work on this. I mean, the 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 traditional mall concept is really not a feasible concept moving forward. And so this idea to relook at what is the most used street in the county, 41st, one of the most central locations, and turn it into a, a multi-use project really should be commended. I mean, the housing component you talk about with your kids, everybody's facing. I think it's actually the defining issue for elected officials of our current time because it impacts a lot of different elements. When we talk about transportation issues, well, when all the housing, affordable housing is built in the southern portion of the county and all the jobs are in the nor northern part of the county, it's not hard to figure out why you have traffic issues. Uh, we have a lot of people moving, especially young professionals, people that were raised here, developed a connection here, want to come back here and can't. And when you talk about then some of the tech companies, what's interesting there is that we're seeing in both Capitola, Aptos, and other portions of the county, a lot of Silicon Valley money coming in and buying second homes here, turning them into vacation rentals that also impact the housing stock. So it becomes even worse when you don't have an affordable housing component to maintain a current community stock and you actually drive up prices where the only people that can afford them are uh, non-local tech people that are coming in and doing that. And it's not, to, um, it's not to hold any grudge against individuals that do that, but it has a significant impact on the local housing stock. And as a policymaker, when you're trying to address that issue, it makes it even harder uh, to build more affordable housing to meet that need. So I think the Capitola component is something that would have a significant impact. And I think people get concerned. They say, this is going to mean all these are new people coming in. It's not. I mean, we have people 17 to 25 per house in a section I represent in Watsonville, mm -hmm. people are not living in safe conditions in certain portions of our county. Just a four, uh, at the Aptos Village, we had a couple hundred applicants for the first five affordable housing units that we were providing. Qualified applicants. We had more applicants than that. Those are people that actually qualified for the units. You had to do a lottery to do it. There's a, there's a huge, these are all local residents. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a huge desire for it. Uh, and I think that one of the advantages of what will happen in Capitola is it'll probably significantly reduce commutes for a lot of people that are currently living in other portions of the county to allow people to live more mid-county near services. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of pricing uh, for housing, uh, Zach, being some of the highest uh, in the county, uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what's being done at the county uh, level with a little bit more detail um, to, to circumvent some of that uh, other than the city? The city is doing some great stuff. Uh, tremendous, and it doesn't surprise me. The city of Capitola, is, Capitola has always been proactive and has done a ton of great things. Uh, I think for the community at large. But in terms of uh, what you what you would guess might be successful, and and what what I mean, what kind of um, I guess time schedule are we looking at in terms of the, how the county might address those housing issues, and when will they actually happen? Would you guess? It's not going to happen soon enough for people that are currently struggling with this. But I'll say that the county. 
Uh, and I would say that most of the jurisdictions throughout the county have probably done more to increase housing stock in the last five years than they've done in the last 30 years. I mean, look, Santa Cruz County in general has been pretty good about saying no to a lot of things over the last couple of decades, pretty good about saying no even to good ideas. This kind of concept that if you don't build it, people won't show up, and that hasn't been the case. Yeah. Uh, what, you just have, what you've done is you've ended up not providing a stock for people that actually desperately need it, and especially low-income people. Okay. But the county, one of the, actually one of the things that I brought forward was, was an elimination of fees uh, for 640 square foot or smaller accessory dwelling units. What, what's, uh, what, what's an ADU? An ADU, a granny uh, unit. Granny the, unit. The small units that, that okay. it actually could be a conversion of a garage, by the way. It doesn't have to be built outside of, of your current footprint. It could be a conversion mm -hmm. of something internally. Because to Councilmember Bator's point, it's really hard to build new stock, especially a lot of new stock. Mm -hmm. If you're building, if 50 new units are, or 50 units every year are being converted to vacation rentals and I'm building 25 new units, I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. the math doesn't work. But ADUs can actually happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. And if you provide an incentive for that to happen, and the county's done it, because I found, uh, obviously, fees in a regulatory process are some of the things that provide a barrier to this kind of construction. Uh, so we streamlined the process to the point where we tried to make it an over-the-counter permit for some of these smaller units. Uh, we have an accessory dwelling unit toolkit, something you might be kind of familiar with now. Mm -hmm. And while there still are complications, uh, depending upon where you live or where the zoning in that area might be, if you're on a well or various things like that, mm -hmm. disproportionately if you're in within the urban areas, it's really easy. And we've seen an 80% increase since we've done this in the number of applications for ADUs within our area. Damn. Is it enough? No. Is it something that really wasn't that hard to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it strikes me that every jurisdiction could do exactly what the county's doing on that. Because while it's great to think about these 700 unit locations, they don't really exist in the county. Mm -hmm. But we can build 700 ADUs in the next 12 months by just changing the regulatory process that we have in each of the jurisdictions and providing that incentive uh, for people to do it. We did that at the county. Yeah, uh, if you go to the website uh, for the county for the ADUs, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Boy, I, I've, I've gone there uh, and I've looked at it. Uh, and we've talked about it on this show before. Uh, it is very user friendly. Uh, it, in fact, I've had people from other counties talk about ADUs. Uh, a couple of friends of mine from Santa Clara, they go, you guys ought to definitely check out what we're doing. Uh, and it, I think you were instrumental, uh, the county was, I think you particularly though, uh, in making it a little bit easier for that to happen. Could you talk a little bit about that when you go to the website? What does it do? Yeah, so we, we wanted it to be, uh, and I give a lot of credit to our housing team that clearly was waiting for the policy direction and funding to do this. I mean, you can people that work in planning aren't there yeah. to not allow housing stock to get built, but they need the policymakers to actually say, this is a priority and we're going to change the regulatory framework to do it. Sure. On the ADU side, we created a new ADU website that it has a toolkit. You can plug in square footage, how much you want to build, where you want to build, and you can estimate all of your costs and length of time to construct. It gives you examples of models to build. I mean, not quite an off-the-shelf model, but to the degree that you can say, I like number three, and you can come in and work with a planner, and it significantly reduces the amount of time that it'll take to go through the planning process. Sure. And if you're even willing to deed-restrict that unit, say you want to rent it to a teacher, and you're saying, I'm going to make it a deed-restricted affordable unit, the county will give you a loan that will cover all of the costs of construction that's forgiven over a certain amount of time. You can actually have a free accessory dwelling unit built if you're creating a new affordable housing unit for our county. Not too bad, actually, because again, it can cost $250,000 per every new unit that we build that's a deed restricted affordable. It can be $30,000 to convert a garage into an affordable mm -hmm. uh, deed restricted unit. So, from the county's perspective, it's even less expensive from a subsidy standpoint, and it's much faster. Uh, and people are taking us up on that as well. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, you went over that at teeny, teeny fast, uh, but if we. <laughs> But because you got it so down, and I get that, you, you know, but uh, let's talk a little bit about that. How can, let's say, uh, uh, the average person that says, well, you know, I've been thinking about something like that. I've got the property. I've been on the same, in the same place for, you know, 25, 30 years. Uh, how can they access or find out whether they'd be eligible for, to getting uh, money from the county to actually build it out? And how, what, what's a deed restriction? Some of the stuff you, w you went through, I think the average person, Michael, what, what does that mean exactly? Sure. Um, so, uh, so there's no surprises. What, what does that mean? Let's say if you want to rent to a teacher uh, or somebody else that let's say might not be able to afford normally to, uh, to, to be able to rent in Santa Cruz, um, how, and they can get money that's either forgivable or just, how does that work? So if you, want, if you are interested in, in just building an accessory dwelling unit in your house, you could go to the county's website at santacruzcounty.us, click on the planning department's 
mm -hmm. blank, and right on the front page there'll be something that'll tell you accessory dwelling units, and there's a toolkit you can look at. Very easy to use mm -hmm. uh, page, interactive page. You can determine if your property is big enough, for example. It probably actually is, but it, it allows you to determine how large of a unit you can build on your property. So this website will tell you, it, it knows, let's say, that you're living in a you know, 1,800 square foot home that you're eligible for 650 square feet. Right. Is that what it does? That's right. I mean, you would, okay. you would, uh, you can look up by parcel number where you are, and it would, it yeah. can help walk you through what's possible yeah. on your site. Um, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that. So I have a lot of people who live in my district that are trying to downsize, and there's no option for them to do that, right? I mean, because right. they might live in two stories. They're, they want to age in place. They don't consider it safe to be in a two or three story home. Yeah. Uh, they would rather live in a single story. Maybe their kids or grandkids want to come into the front unit. So this is not providing that option. So I'm not even talking about necessarily renting to a teacher. That's the second part. If you wanted a, a place where you can age in place and even rent out the front of your house and make money on it, mm -hmm. that's an option because a rental stock is something I need even in standard single family homes. If you want your family to move into the front and then you can be in the back that's a, or in the garage, whatever it may be, or mm -hmm. build above, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to build a 640 square foot or smaller unit, what we consider to be affordable by design, that size, the one bed, standard one bedroom size, uh, the county will, uh, is in a pilot program now where we've functionally eliminated all county fees associated with that size. Well, let's talk about that for a, a moment. So that's an incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, you're drawing people in saying, listen, we're gonna waive some of your fees. So right there, it's kind of it gets people uh, on the right uh, and going in the right direction to say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to save right there, uh, and then on top of that, uh, let's say it, we're going to have probably a savings in the traditional sense of building a place because it's on your property, so you obviously right. own the property, uh, and then also if you look at something like a conversion for a garage, let's say the top part of a garage, you've got the infrastructure already uh, uh, pretty much in place. Mm -hmm. And so you got a whole bunch of savings there. So when somebody traditionally thinks through, they go, oh, I can't afford to build it, you know, $400 a square foot. But there are going to be a lot of savings there. And, and then maybe if they go to their bank and, they, and they're looking for a loan or whatever, uh, the bank's going to probably help them with that too because it's got to make sense that they're going to build it too. Um, what, I mean, what, what are the kind of things that might make somebody fearful about wanting to build an ADU? It sounds like this website uh, does a lot of the helping them through that process of, putting those to rest. Right. Yeah, Talk I about that. I mean, bit. I think that one of the things that people are afraid of in building something is dealing with us. I mean, let's be honest. Maybe you mm -hmm. don't want to come in. The, the county process or the city process is daunting. You have to hire somebody. You don't know who they are mm -hmm. uh, on the outside to help navigate you through the process. You hear all these nightmare stories about it taking years to get approvals. Or, uh, and, and I'm saying those things have totally gone away. I'm not trying to create an unrealistic picture. When it comes to the accessory dwelling units, what the Board of Supervisors has said is, we want these. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to think of a way to expedite the process associated with them. And this toolkit helps do that. If you have certain frameworks, you're functionally uh, uh, allowing, in essence, buy right activities to start occurring on people's properties, which is to say that we're telling you you're going to be able to do this. We're telling the planning department you're going to permit this. And we're also saying we don't think those fees are reasonable. We want to be able to subsidize or eliminate those fees because by you building that small unit, you're adding to the affordable housing stock. Sure. I'd either be subsidizing you or I'm going to be subsidizing some nonprofit housing developer at a much higher rate. But I serve a lot of functions if I subsidize you because you now can have your family live in that unit or you can live in that unit and where your kids and grandkids can take over the front of the house. There's a lot of benefits to, um, through society to have that happen. The fees that we cut out on those 640 square feet or smaller is in the 10 to 20,000 range, depending upon the type of unit that you have. So that's gone now. That's a significant subsidy right there. What also, if I told you that something that used to take 12 months can now be done in less than 90 days? Because that's amazing. Of, I mean, so we're, yeah. and so now yeah. you have time certainty and yeah. every, yeah. every extra day in construction is, is money. Sure. So that's, that, those are the things that we've been trying to do. Now, if you actually wanted to deed restrict it, which you would ask that question, which means that you are making a commitment yes. that that unit will only be rented to somebody that earns a certain percentage of the area median income, which is how affordable housing is determined. So maybe it's a low income, a very low income. It could be a teacher, for example. If you commit to do that for a certain number of years, we will give you a loan on construction that we will forgive once we've seen that that time has actually been used for that purpose over wow. time. Wow. That's, that's amazing. It sounds like uh, that at the county level, uh, some really good things are happening. Um, and, and certainly that is one of our biggest uh, uh, challenges in, in our community is housing. 
Did you have anything to say to me? Yeah, you know, I could just dovetail off what Zach said, because I think cities, our city, for one, is embracing that concept, too. Sure. Because the, the sure. idea you know, of, of affordable housing, as you mentioned earlier, these, these have literally been around for years. We've called them granny units. Okay, yeah. and, and now it's ADU is the fashionable term. But you know, the point Zach made was is we're creating these homes where, where people, a lot of people are forced where they can't afford to live in their home. Yeah. And we want to keep them there. So and they necessarily don't want to rent out a room, they don't want their their, their privacy in it violated. Mm -hmm. So they add on these units in their backyard and, and and they're able to rent these out, you know, feel like for them they feel good because they feel like they're helping someone that's you know, that maybe it's a school teacher, a student, whatever whatever the need may be, but but it's it's a benevolent way of saying this is how we all in Santa Cruz County are realizing we don't have a lot of space, we want to help it out. And then the state has relaxed some of the rules as far as to, to allow cities and counties to, to implement these uh, ADUs faster. Parking restrictions, we've lowered parking restrictions in Capitol. What we mm -hmm. normally require, we, we've reduced that in half mm -hmm. to try to, you know, to let people, make it easier for people to do this because there's definitely a need for this type of housing. So it, it's, it's an all-in great program. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about, um, you guys will probably chuckle, but you'll be very kind about it, uh, <laughs> but how, why, why would somebody, let's say, go to the city as opposed to, to the county? A lot of people aren't aware, uh, you know, how that works. I, I am, but I think maybe our listening audience might not be. So what would be the difference? If somebody wanted to do an ADU, why would they, let's say, if they're close to Capitola, I know the answer, you got to be in the city uh, limits, but how would, would you just call down to the county and say, where do I go, this is my address, or would you get that on the website, or is that only the county website? that shows the county, or would it direct you back to the city? Because not everybody knows all the breakdowns of where the city begins and the county ends and stuff. You know, interesting question. You know, in, 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 as a politician, I want to feel that most of the people know where they live. You know, but there could be the, the borderline people, because you know, a lot of people, when I ask them, they come and they'll, they'll speak at a city council meeting, and they'll say, well, I said, where do you live? And they say, I live in Capitola. And then it turns out they, they live in Opal Cliffs, and they're really not in Capitola. You know, oh, they, yeah, yeah, like, they, right off 41st. So, yeah, 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 they, they feel yeah. like, well, no, I shop yeah. in Capitola, yeah. and, I, you know, yeah. and I come to the village, and, and I live in, and they tell people I live in Capitola. So, yeah, yeah you know, you're, you're going to have to do the research because it's a completely different set of rules. Yeah, I, I, it sounds like the county's program is a lot more generous. But, than but the a, city phone, a phone call will get it done. A though. phone call to the city says, hey, this is my address. I'm trying to verify do I live in the county or the city. Okay. Uh, and city okay. capital easy, easily tough. Okay. And it sounds like both the city and the county, and I would imagine other cities as well, uh, are pretty much on the same page in terms of getting ADUs and, and, and getting through the building process because everybody, a lot of people go, ah, building, you know, everybody freaks out. Yeah, we've heard the, the horror stories. But um, well, the state's behind this. The state's given us all a big push. It's, sure. I think the state is an advocate for ADUs yeah. and they've re relaxed a lot of the, of the rules, and then that enables us to carry that on too. And I think the county's taken a big step here. You know, promoting that, and we're we're not doing the things where we're willing to finance or do any kind of a you know loan uh, forgiveness. But uh, maybe that day's coming, so we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good stuff. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, you guys are interacting so well with this particular topic. Uh, anytime we talk about housing, it's always you know a hot topic, uh, especially on this show. But uh, it certainly is something that everybody's very interested in, and both of you are, are, are very uh, well equipped and, and well informed. So thank you for that. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, it's coming from our elected. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, traffic and some of the uh, things that are um, uh, you know, on the uh, horizon. And maybe we'll start with Zach, uh, and, and it, certainly you can chime in, because I know both of you uh, have a lot of experience with this. Uh, that is probably the second, in my, if I were to guess, the second most prominent uh, issue that we have, uh, traffic in, in our county. Um, you know, if you have to come in like I do, uh, at, at certain times it's like, you know, a 45 minute drive and the other times it's like about a 15 minute drive. Um, if you go over the hill, certainly that's another issue. But um, we've been talking about traffic, I think, uh, to one extent or the other for a lot of years. And maybe we'll start out with Zach at a county level. Uh, what's on the horizon? What's being done uh, about it uh, correct, uh, to correct, you know, some of the stuff that's out there right now? Traffic jams, nobody likes to be sure. with one, but. Well, and, uh... Obviously, I hope that Ed chimes in as the chair of the Regional Transportation Commission on this, but I, I'll say that one of the, it is a very common thing I'm asked, or, or road conditions in general, like the quality of the roads, the falling apart, potholes, whatever it may be, the network. But I think the first thing to talk about, Lou, isn't actually traffic, but why we have traffic is actually an important thing, because we generally people ask for a transportation solution because they see it as a transportation-only problem, and it isn't. As we just talked about housing, as again, you have seen, especially even post the recession, the crash, people have had to move further away that lost their homes or needed to find affordable rent, even further from their jobs than where they used to. 
And if you have all the affordable housing in one portion of the county or even out of county, we have a lot of people that actually pass through from Monterey County on, seven, on Highway 1 to go to 17 or to work in the city of Santa Cruz. A lot of our employees for the city of Capitola, for the county, they don't even live in the county. They can't afford to live in the county. Yeah. So there's a housing and job imbalance that actually creates a major part of the traffic issue we're talking about. So even though we like to have these long debates on the Transportation Commission about whether you should have a train or a trail or how much bus service we're widening the highway, mm -hmm. realistically, uh, solving the affordable housing problem would actually have a bigger impact on transportation than almost anything else we can do. With that said, there, is, there are needs to, to deal with the transportation network. During that time of construction south, we did nothing on the highway. And you can't do that. We provided no infrastructure in places like Watsonville. They're seeing it in their schools. They're seeing it in a lot of challenges. Um, and you sit on the highway for 45 minutes. That's actually a pretty good day, I think. <laughs> uh, I go to Aptos, and it's at least 45 minutes from Santa Cruz. A lot of times it could be as long as an hour. Yeah. And people struggle to know when they're going to get their kid on and on and on. So what is being done is looking at it first also on the housing side and having people recognize it's a housing thing. The second thing is that of the 30,000 uh, vehicles or 60,000 approximately people that, that actually do the commute over every single day, uh, some of which don't even live in this county. A lot of them live in, or work in Silicon Valley for some of the greatest tech companies in the history of time, right? Google, Facebook, Netflix, Apple, all those places charter buses mm -hmm. from here to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars a month in total. Mm -hmm. And I've asked them, we've had meetings with these companies, why don't you have a satellite office in Santa Cruz County? I mean, all your people are already here. Yeah, yeah. And it comes back to broadband, which sounds totally, you're like, well, what does that have to do with this discussion about traffic, Zach, right? But it ha what it has to do with is that they would keep employees to either telecommute a day a week or build satellite office in this county if they felt we had the internet infrastructure for them to do it. Mm -hmm. Just think about what that would, would do for traffic. And you can tell, Small changes in traffic, like Pajaro Valley Unified's not in session or Cabrillo's out of session, and you can travel a lot faster. These are just a couple percentage points of difference on the highway. So if you had 5,000 of those 60,000 people, 5,000 of those 30,000 cars, not on any given day, you would actually solve a lot of the transportation issue without even a transportation solution. So you have to look at it in a holistic way. Mm -hmm. um, on the transportation side directly, though, Measure D was, was a godsend. It's not, is it enough? It's never enough. But is it something that we've never had before? Yes. Uh, we are already in the environmental side on the next section of, of highway widening. Mm -hmm. I know it's controversial, but look, it's happening. And I think a lot of people, at least in my district, think we should go for it. And I'm with them on that. Uh, to go from SoCal to 41st, so they can get down to Ed's house <laughs> in Capitola uh, in the next couple years, actually. So we anticipate construction on that could start as early as 2020, which is a big deal. Uh, Ed's on Metro, and you can talk about the bus on shoulder. There's a, a larger study about how to get buses on the side so that they can actually increase that as well. But I think it's a housing, a job, a broadband infrastructure, and a transportation side in order to deal with the uh, issues we deal with the traffic. Yeah, you know, you, Zach brings up a good point. I mean, he started with the holistic look from the outside. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is, is that the infrastructure in Santa Cruz County is so far behind that, that the problem is exacerbated now to where everybody's pulling their hair out, especially if, you're, if you've got to make that commute from South County to a job in, in Santa Cruz. And, and if you're not going to have part of the conversation about broadband and about housing, and that's why when we talk about the mall and living at the mall, if we can get people to live where they work, mm -hmm. that's going to relieve the congestion. But it always still comes back to the point we have to deal with transportation problems, and, 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 and Highway 1 is, you know, seriously needs more capacity. And the only money that we've got right now is to do these auxiliary lanes, which, you know, we've got the first one that we put in uh, from Morrissey, which I think works tremendously. You know, the, the people that are going to be getting off the freeway allows them to relieve out of that mainstream. And if we continue those all the way up, I think the plan is to get them up to State Park. Uh, I think that's going to relieve some of that congestion over time. Uh, the thing I'm kind of excited about by sitting, as, as Zach mentioned, on, on the Metro board is, is you know, the, 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 the current method of transportation we have that works for most people, especially the underserved, is the bus system. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the way that that bus works is if the bus is a viable alternative for people. We've got people now riding the, the, the Highway 17 bus over to Silicon Valley because sometimes you just don't want to sit in that traffic or the mm -hmm. stress or the road conditions. So that's actually showing some good numbers. And the new concept that we're trying to work on is we're going to do this bus on shoulder program where, where the idea is, is if we could get an express bus from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, people are going to be more inclined to ride it because they're not going to sit in that main street. I mean, we, we don't have the commuter lanes that we can use and, and you know, that, that people can buy into. 
that that's too far down the road. But this this if a bus could get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz in a reasonable amount of time, let's say twenty five minutes, mm -hmm. I think that we could sell that bus system. So this is a program where we, we call it bus on shoulder, but what it's gonna do is the bus is actually gonna be running on the auxiliary lane. And when it gets to the intersections where you where most of us have to exit and get off, there's gonna be a path roadway cut through there where they're gonna be able to you know, there'll be a, a gate that goes through or, or some kind of device where they can continue to proceed straight through and not have to get off there. So I'm looking forward to that. That's something that could happen in the next couple of years. And because and, what people want from us as policymakers is they want instant relief. People come to me and they say, what can you do for me right now? And that becomes a tough choice. Let's talk about the auxiliary uh, lane. You said uh, between Morrissey uh, and uh, what, what is Soquel. that? Soquel. Oh, yeah. It's it's what you're doing is you're actually building the third lane of, of the freeway, but because it's not continuous, you know that it's an auxiliary lane because you're only allowed to get on it and get off of it before the next intersection. That's it's it. not a continue. You can't say that it's a, it's an additional lane because it terminates. Okay. So the term that the Caltrans uses is auxiliary lane, and it allows you know for three lanes of traffic in that in that primary space. But what it does is it assists the cars that are merging on, mm -hmm. and then it allows those that are going to be exiting to pull over into that lane get off and, and then you're reducing the numbers in the primary two lanes that are gonna go straight through. So that's what the funding we have for. The, the, the biggest part of doing these, these uh, widening the freeway is, is replacing the bridges. That's where millions of dollars are spent. Mm. And that's why the auxiliary lanes can be put in at a, at a lesser cost. When you start replacing the bridges mm -hmm. is where the real expense comes in the program. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay, um, any, you wanna chime in on that, Zach? You did a good job, Ed. You guys are on <laughs> the same board with the transportation? Uh, yeah, we oh. used to serve on Metro together as well, and now we serve both on the Regional Transportation Commission, and for okay. those watching, what is the Regional Transportation Commission, right? It is a uh, state-mandated regional planning commission that deals with transportation funding. It is a pass-through uh, organization for state and federal funds. It has members, uh, the entire Board of Supervisors sits on it, a couple members that serve from Metro serve on it, and then representatives from each of the cities serve on it, and it plays a pretty significant role in determining where financing for local, or excuse me, regional, uh, road and transportation projects will go. So, so that uh, decision is made locally, uh, and the money tr uh, goes through. What does the money originate from uh, for the transportation? From well, tax, tax basis? Yeah, I mean, that's an, it's an interesting question, because now we have a local tax uh, funding mechanism that we didn't previously have. Metro's had one for an extended period of time, uh, although that funding is actually determined by formula and therefore some of that it actually goes straight to the jurisdictions, meaning the cities. Uh, it's mainly a state and federal funding mechanism where you have funding that comes through. There are restrictions on some of this funding. Some of this funding, for example, can't be used to fix a, a residential road. Yeah. Uh, it would be, have to be used on a SoCal or a 41st, for example. Some mm -hmm. of it can only be used on highways. Mm -hmm. Some of it can only be used for mass transit purposes. And if it's state funding, a lot of it under AB 32 has to deal with carbon neutrality, and, and a lot of funding uh, mechanisms have to show how it's dealing with the carbon footprint as well, which also changes how highway funding comes. You used mm -hmm. to have more available for highways than you do today. Mm -hmm. uh, federal comes with less, I don't know if the word's restrictions, but it has a, a different sort of approach in how the federal funding goes. But what we're mainly talking about now is, is really Measure D funding. You have a local stable tax uh, that actually is providing funding that we haven't seen in decades to deal with multimodality, be it uh, funding for the bus, be it for paratransit, be it for the highway, or be it for local roads, including residential streets that haven't been touched in I mean, decades in a lot of areas in my district. And I hear it with Measure D, too. It also, once we got it uh, uh, to the ballot and everybody voted, uh, it was a really skinny margin, but those are usually skinny margins to get approval on. It's a three-quarter uh, vote, I think? Two-thirds. Two-thirds, Two okay. Yeah. The, uh, big, the big thing about Measure D, and Zach didn't get to this point, and I think it's really critical, is that before we voted to pass Measure D, which, quite frankly, without Measure D, there's a lot of programs that would, would not be happening today. We wouldn't sure. be doing the road repairs. But the big thing that came out of that was we became listed on the state as a self-help county, which yes. means yes. we're eligible for some more state funds now. We haven't tapped into those as yeah. of yet, but we're applying for those. And, and yeah. I'm optimistic that as time goes on, we're, we're going to be re getting more of those funds. Let's talk about what self-help means, because I think that's pretty significant. Actually, Bruce McPherson and I talked about that when we were uh, talking about Measure D uh, and before it, was, uh, it went to the voters. Um, I am pleased as anything uh, because I hear from my uh, folks, uh, my electeds uh, and my representatives that uh, that's a big issue. It's a bigger issue, I think, than most people can even imagine because it, it does something different to us 
uh, in layperson's uh, terms, maybe you can explain how what that self-help thing uh, does for us. How do, why does it identify us differently than what we've been identified for a lot of prior years? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And Bruce McPherson is a good example because you know he's someone well versed in state legislature. That was his career. And when he was a big proponent on this committee on Measure D, he was a big player in, in getting that to pass. Is that right now what we were doing is we were just applying for state and lo and and federal funds uh, without having any tax measure on ourselves to contribute to that. And mm -hmm. by passing Measure D, which we did, we get listed as being self help because we are actually contributing some of our own dollars through our taxes, half percent sales tax. We we are taking money out of our own pockets, contributing to the fund, and hope that the state and federal match that. But without us willing to tax ourselves mm -hmm. to say that we are self responsible, the state and feds don't pay attention to us. So, so how how does that uh, affect us in the future now that we are self help uh, 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 county? Because I understand there's some significance there in terms of let's say when we go for uh, uh, more money, uh, and I don't want to misquote how I, I think it's supposed. To happen, but tell me about the future because of that happening. Well, the future is, is that there's lots of counties in the state where accessing funds that we were exempt from. Though Those funds the state makes and certain programs come up, or there's incentive programs or, or even portions of SB1, money becomes available to self-help counties. Well, we were never on that list. So and now we are. We are right. on that list, and like I said, we haven't as of yet tapped into a, a fund source yet, but we, we, we've only been doing this for two years now, and that's mm -hmm. how long it takes in the process. And optimistically, I'm going to believe that, that if we move forward and we decide to do something on the rail trail, or if we decide that we want to do highway extensions and maybe build some bridges, because the mm -hmm. money we have right now for Measure D is only enough money to do the auxiliary lanes up to, I believe, State Park. But if we really want to seriously do something where we have, you know, HOV lanes or, or replace those bridges, we would be able to apply under the self-help criteria and possibly compete seriously for those funds. So to, to build on what Ed just said, that there are, when the legislature passed transportation le funding legislation, they generally carve out a portion of that dollar mm -hmm. that they're giving mm -hmm. to just counties or cities that have their own tax. So what we were competing against was people on the 75 cents of that dollar where they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. But 25 cents is carved out now for also self-help counties. So we have a much smaller pool that we can tap in for the 25 cents and we can still compete on the 75 cents. Mm -hmm. On the federal side, they generally will say, you have to have a local match if we're going to fund you. But we didn't have that prior well, to Measure It was D. very, very difficult for us to come up with the money. And so yeah. what, what, and when yeah. it makes sense, because they would say to them, if we're going to give you a dollar, we want $2 worth of road work done, mm -hmm. because that makes the federal government look good. And it was very hard for us to provide the extra dollar. So now we're actually able to provide that local match that we couldn't before. So it, it opens up, by law, it opens up new options for us at the state. And by practice at the federal side, it opens up a whole new set because we can actually meet the federal match that we couldn't, or the local match for federal things that we couldn't do before. And, and one of the good things too, I remember about Measure D, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but there was some, something that was sunsetting uh, that tax and then this one came in and kind of replaced it. So the, the, the net effect on, on most everybody in the county was pretty much there was no additional taxes because something else was going away. But was that it or do you remember? That? I don't know about... I don't know about that. We seem pretty good about adding additional things to people yeah. that are supposed you know, to take no, it away. So, sometimes sunsetting, we, we get caught up into rolling them over and extending yeah. them. So I'm not familiar of anything that's sunset. Okay. 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 I think the only thing I recall when I came on was that they said when we tried to do this self-help last time, it failed miserably. I think Bruce has, has explained that to us here. We really have to you know, convince okay. people that, that yeah. this is good for the whole county. Yeah. And you know, when you, when you look at how Measure D passed, it, it, was, it was really bringing a lot of people together. There were people that were pro-train, there were people that were anti-widening, uh, pro-bus. Everybody really had to get in there. And like I said, it yeah. only passed by 1%, I think, of the margin. One or but they're usually pretty close, though, anyways. Anything is close. And when you're talking, it was a $450 million bill. So, sure. I mean, it, sure. it, but, but the thing is, is whatever it happens, I have to commend Santa Cruz County for, even though if you didn't like something on the bill, there was something good for everybody, I believe. Yeah. And Santa Cruz County collectively came together and made this happen. So it now allows us to take a real serious look at some future transportation needs. Amazing. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Some good yeah. stuff. I mean, we've got some uh, folks like yourself that are committed, that love this community. Um, again, I, I love talking uh, with our electeds. Uh, you bring so much to the table, and there's just so much you know, good stuff, but you can tell that you're both in love with this community. Uh, and to me, that, uh, that says a lot of uh, uh, what I think should be said uh, from uh, elected politicians. So thank you for your, your commitment. Uh, actually, we've only got a few more minutes, about, uh, about 10 more minutes or so. Um, and I wanted to talk about 
what you guys wanted to talk about, what's kind of, you know, a, a, something that you just would not feel like it completed this show unless you talked about it. Um, I've got a couple more questions I can throw out to you, but let me start um, with you, Ed, and then I will finish uh, with Zach. Um, and something that uh, is just, you got to talk about. You know, you couldn't ask a better question, okay? It's almost like I slipped you the question under the table so you would ask me this. I got elected seven years ago, and, and uh, I actually moved to Capitola to retire. And one of the main things I wanted to bring to Capitola What did you was, retire from, by the way? I was a firefighter for 30 years. Okay, excellent. Yeah. excellent. And when I moved to Capitola, there, there, I mean, everybody knows this has been to Capitola, but years ago in the 1900s, there was this beautiful, glamorous hotel that was in Capitola, and it burned down, and they rebuilt it, and it burned down again, and then that was it. And, and the spot's been vacant there. It's been a parking lot for years, and I always wanted... I always thought that, that in, in government I would get something done. Now, seven years later, it's not there. But Give us the location of this. This is so in we Cap can picture it. Capitola Village next to the Britannia Arms restaurant is uh, where the, ho the old hotel was located. And I am a big proponent of rebuilding a hotel on that site. I yep. feel it would be a big shot. It would, first of all, it would be great tax revenue for the city of Capitola. And now, this is the place where the little ladies used to have 25% popcorn, and it was 75 cents to get in. Is that the, is yeah. that the theater? Yeah, yeah, it was the theater. That could be at the theater, yeah. <laughs> so I remember got, that. You've got better stories. I've only lived here for 10 years, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still the, the town carpetbagger, so uh, that, that, that goes This goes well. back a ways. So. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'm dating myself. I, I, you, you have to, if you're going to love Capitola, you have to embrace the history. And Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean No, that. you're not interrupting. You know, it, it's, it's all good stuff. But I am now, on a, we just had another, not an application, but the, the, the owners of the property came with a conceptual drawing of what do you think of Capitola. And I think a lot of citizens are afraid of the idea of a hotel in Capitola because they, they may think it's too big or they don't like the size. And, and I'm going to be holding some, uh, I'm glad you brought this up, I'm going to be holding some town hall meetings throughout town. Because I think what, what your show does... Who, what, who comes to your town hall? I haven't had one yet. I'm going to have them in neighborhoods. I'm going to get people to invite me into their neighborhoods, okay. into their homes, and invite okay. people to come. It's kind of like campaigning, which I'm not doing anymore because I'm termed out. Okay. But my last little hurrah is I want to have meetings where I can share information with people because yeah. that's what's lacking. Yeah. That's like your show. Your show gives information to people. Sure. And I just want to share with them the values of having a hotel, a why capital needs a hotel, what we can do to make it so hotel they'll like. It's kind of like the slogan for this commi committee is say yes to Capitola. So could we, could somebody call you, look you up uh, at the city and say, I'd like to do a little coffee clutch at my house, maybe have 10 or 12 neighbors come in and let's talk about this. And you'd do, be willing to do that, uh, let's say throughout uh, Capitola. See, I told you I slipped you a piece of paper for this. That's exactly <laughs> what I want to do. Okay. okay. I would love, I want to go out. I want to meet with the citizens of Capitola. Explain to them why this is such a great idea, and uh, excellent, and it, it'll be good for the city in the long run. Okay, good. Thanks. Good. good. So that, then, how how can our uh, viewers uh, uh, get involved with that to find out more about it, and then actually uh, you know get information besides your coffee clutches? Where else where else can they get information? Well, you know, right now there's there's not a lot of information on it because the 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 builders came with a conceptual presentation. Until they submit a permit, it's really not on the agenda. It's not something okay. we're talking about. So my idea was to get out get in front of it, try to solicit some in encouragement. Okay. That's, so I go back to the builders and say, you know what, I think we've got some momentum in Capitola. Maybe this would be a good time for you to submit a permit. So my, my email address is here. They're more than welcome if you have that on your site. They're more than welcome to email me or they can reach, that's the same email on the city website. And uh, I'm more than willing to come into anybody's home or their, their community center or their, uh, 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 their park or their church, wherever they want to meet, I will come and share the the pros and cons of a hotel in Capitola. Excellent. Good, good. I went to uh, that city council meeting, and I, I, I was, I was some positive, good stuff happening there. A lot of good information. Um, and uh, my suggestion, you know, for people that are out there, maybe to get involved and go to some of the city council uh, meetings when, they're, uh, when they come up on the agenda, those kinds of things. Or watch on TV. Yeah, or on TV, community TV. Yeah. Um, good. Okay. Well, do you want to say any any uh, almost last words, uh, uh, Zach, uh, about anything that you you just got to get out? Well, I, let me uh, compliment this guy real quick on the fact that he's looking at bigger picture issues. And one thing that I think that uh, most people don't run for office because they're interested in filling a pothole, but they want to actually fix the whole road. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned in in the eight or so years I've been in, on the board is that really does require. Uh, the community giving you the space and understanding to do it because it takes longer than than it would seem and meaning that if if you save the money from pothole filling for a year you actually could probably fill the whole road uh back in but people um as ed noted uh they want things done now and i understand that because i do too when there's issues in front of my house but i think as a community 
we are at a we're at an interesting point on housing, on transportation, mm -hmm. on future planning. People feeling the sense of character being lost. I'm losing my kids to other communities. Is it a second home, bedroom community even more than it used to be? So now's the time. I think that that, that there needs to be that community conversation about what's Capitola going to look like, what's Aptos going to look like, what's Watsonville going to be look like. Who should be? Uh, why is one section of the county shouldering disproportionate amount of the burdens? All these kinds of components of, is it acceptable to have that many people living in one house and not just a first world country, but a first world county? Mm. And I think that we, if we really are a progressive community, uh, we shouldn't find a lot of these things acceptable. But as a result, it takes a lot of introspection um, and things that aren't always comfortable in a conversation. Sometimes the votes aren't comfortable and sometimes the reality of where things get built may not be comfortable to you because it may end up in your own uh, neighborhood or community. Um, that, though, is what is going to actually change things for the better uh, for this community. And also, it means that we're controlling the change as opposed to the other way around. If we uh, take an approach of saying no to a lot of stuff, change will, it's still going to happen, but it's unmanaged. And we end up with these other results right now that we don't like. If we're a part of the process, willing to do what I don't see at the national level now, which is compromise and have an honest conversation and be with people you don't agree with, but in your own community, you gotta be able to do that. You see them at the grocery store, they definitely see us at the grocery store and let us know what they think. Uh, then that will actually make a difference for the next 30 years. Because we're dealing with decisions made for the 30 years before us. Uh, hopefully we can set the table differently for the next people that are sitting in our chairs and, and that's where I'd like to be. I get to toot your horn a little bit. You are running for <laughs> reelection and I'm gonna talk about a couple things and uh, maybe something that our listening audience can remember you uh, by in terms of the last two terms that you've been uh, uh, serving, uh, what, what have you, you? And I know you. I know what they are. You've done some significant good things in, in our community. Um, not to embarrass you, put you on the spot, but I get to do that sometimes. Tell us about a couple of the good things that you've done, um, because I think it's important that our listening audience know that you have done some good things. That you're here to stay. That you've got some national uh, experience. You've got some national roots. I mean, you you trained, uh, you know, at the academic level to do what you're doing. It's by no coincidence that you have had a tremendous success uh, in the district and you've made some significant good things happen. But talk about a couple of them and, and maybe give us and tease us a little bit with uh, some things that you have uh, as goals for uh, if you get reelected. Uh, and it seems like that you've got a good following uh, for sure. So let's talk a teeny bit about that. We are running short on time, but if you can give us a couple <laughs> minutes on that. Well, <laughs> well thanks. A mouthful, Lou. right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, when, but when I first came into office, uh, we were just getting out, just coming out of the recession. So I mean, a lot of that was how do you restore services? And we've done a lot of it in our district. We built the first new park in Aptos in a generation. We've remodeled a couple more. And the next year, we're going to get remodeling on, on Seacliff Park, a new skate park, which is very exciting nice. for kids that need that outlet. Nice. Uh, Hidden Beach Park has not been touched in 25 years. That's going to be redone. We've got the new pump track in the South County at Pinto Lake Park, the first such uh, opportunity for the kids in Watsonville. Uh, the sheriff's office was down a few dozen uh, deputies. We brought them back up to full staffing. And uh, one of the things that I did that maybe isn't that sexy, but I think is really cool, is we developed the first mobile app for people in the community to be able to interact with government in a different way. You got a pothole in your street, pull up the phone, take a picture of it, it geolocates it, sends it out, and it handles everything behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about whether it's nine to five or the planning department's open whatever time. Everything from registering to vote to looking at the environmental health components of local restaurants. So just before you go in, you get that one last check to make sure it's a safe place to eat. Yeah. You can now all do on this free app. And uh, it sounds simple because you can do that in a lot of the corporate world, but in government, that's a unique idea. But that interactivity, uh, that availability is a big thing that I'm, I'm proud of. Excellent, good. Any goals for uh, the years to come? Uh, as a county supervisor. Change the trajectory for the next people that sit in our seats. Take the responsibility of the fact that I've got a four-year-old son who is probably looking at me, A, wondering what I'm going to make him for dinner, but two, wondering whether I'm going to leave him a community that he can be proud of. Okay. I think that that's a reasonable uh, thing to do. Um, there's no longer a them. I'm in that position. So I shoulder sure. all the blame and responsibility. I'm comfortable with that, but I'd hope that we can shift some of the stuff on housing, transportation, resiliency planning with climate change and some of the major issues that are going to be facing our time, uh, we can do something here at the local level that other people maybe aren't getting done at the national level. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for, for uh, all, all your great information. Um, and I always like to kind of have a, a couple minutes of a, a, minute a wrap-up, and we're close to that time. We've got uh, three minutes left. And uh, so let's do about a minute for each of you in some... Something you'd like to leave our listening audience with that they can remember this show by and you by. Let's start with it. 
You know, I, I, this is my first show here, and it's been a great experience. And I, I think it, it, it takes off a little bit, Zach. That you know, I, I, my my political career is, going, career is going to be coming to an end next year. And uh, Capitol, you two terms, and you're you're out. So yes. uh, it's yeah. been it's been yeah. great for me, and I'm I'm happy to serve. And what I'm most excited about is is that I've encouraged uh, younger people to get involved in, in city government, Capitol, and we've got two young women on our on our council right now yes. that are just um, you know embracing that whole concept. And and I'm glad I'm sitting back watching it and I'm ready to turn the town over to new people. You know, Capitola tr traditionally has been a town run by, I call them legacy people. They've been there forever, you know, and some, some council members have served multiple terms and they've invested their whole life. And I just think it's time to, uh, to take a little quick move forward and uh, embrace the future. Uh, I'm excited. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for, for your service, for sure. I uh, appreciate that. And it's always fun to do uh, campaigning and it takes a lot of work and time and energy and, uh, you know, funding and uh, to be able to, uh, you know, put a, aside what you had for retirement and you did a lot of work on uh, in, in the city. So thank you for all your hard work for sure. I'm sure you're going to be involved in some way, somewhere. <laughs> I'll probably work on his campaign. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Zach. Um, really for the viewers to, this is more of an ask for them to, to get involved. A lot of the voices, it's, we see the same people at every uh, community event that yeah. we do, every board meeting that we have, every commission meeting we have, uh, and the voice, there are some voices that really aren't represented at the table that need to be represented at the table, and people may not recognize at the local level, you can really influence the decision-making process and you can really get things done. Don't only come to us because something bad has happened, uh, but help us shape the process moving forward. Get involved in the process early, and you'd be surprised uh, for people that are so jaded about what they see at the national level, that is not what's happening at the local level. Yes. Uh, there's there's an already accessible. We have open. I have open office hours every week in Aptos, Watsonville, Coralito, Seascape. You can meet with me mm -hmm. at any time. Ed, same thing. We do these town halls, community meetings. I mean, really, you can help shape the future of this community, but you need to be involved uh, and and help participate in the local democracy in a new way. Okay, so getting uh, involved locally it w would be. Uh kind of your mantra for uh, our listening audience. And, and it's available, it's out there. Um, it, it, all you have to do is just kind of show up for the most part. That's correct. Okay, good, good. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for, uh, for being here. And we are, we are close to that uh, time, 30 seconds, 20 seconds. We are done. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Thanks for the opportunity.